G'day guys, Tyler from METS here. Welcome back as we continue to go through the key knowledge from Unit 3 Area of Study 2. We're not going to get into any analysis type stuff today. We're going to stick to the key knowledge. We'll get into some more in-depth application questions in a couple of weeks time once we've made sure we've got these this nuts and bolts stuff down pat. Today we're going to be looking at fuels and fuels for resynthesis of ATP. So the fuels that we can use to get energy for movement. So we've put down over here energy for movement. That is the goal. Um, that's what we're going to talk about a lot in PE. All of the energy that we get for movement is going to come from ATP. So adenosine triphosphate is made up of one adenosine molecule and three phosphates all bonded together. We touched on this the other day when we were looking at our energy system characteristics. The way this is work is we're going to break down that bond. One of those phosphate molecules is going to break away, leaving an ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and that extra phosphate that's broken away. When that, when that bond is broken, it releases energy which allows us to move. Problem is we only have two to three seconds of this stored ATP in our body. So this is what we would call a chemical fuel that we have stored. When we want to start exercising, that's good, we have some, we can start getting that energy straight away, but we only have two to three seconds before that ATP is all broken down to these ADPs and these phosphate molecules which are no good to us. So what we need to do is we need to resynthesize the ATP. We need to be able to recharge, reattach this phosphate molecule back to the ADP and we've got this ATP again. So we're constantly breaking this down for energy and then using um, other fuel sources to resynthesize it or recharge it so that we can keep getting that energy. The first one we're gonna talk about is one of our, is our chemical fuel, our other chemical fuel. Phosphocreatine, I'm sure you've heard of it, PC, is a chemical fuel that we have stored in the body. It can be broken down really quickly. It is a really simple chemical reaction to break that down which means we can resynthesize ATP at a really rapid rate. We talk about an explosive rate. So when we're using PC as our fuel source through the ATP PC energy system, we will be resynthesizing ATP at an explosive rate. We get it back, so that will give us really high bursts of energy. That's good. In that point of view, PC is a good fuel. The downside is that we only have 10 to 12 seconds of it. So just like we only have a couple of seconds of stored ATP, we only have 10 to 12 seconds of stored PC. So while it does give us really explosive energy, we are going to deplete those stores very quickly. Once they have been depleted, we're not going to be able to resynthesize them without a passive recovery or a very, very low intense type recovery. So if we're going to keep wanting to perform um, physical activity in sport or training or something like that, we're going to need another fuel to allow us to keep resynthesizing ATP. That brings us over to our food fuel. So the fuels that we're going to get from into our body by eating. We're going to talk about carbohydrates, fats, and protein as our three food fuels. We'll start with carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are our body's preferred fuel for exercise because they are much easier to break down than fats are. We can, get, we can break down carbohydrates much quicker to get that energy. So when we eat carbohydrates, we're going to store them uh, in our body as glucose in the bloodstream or as glycogen in the muscle tissue and the liver. We can then break those down with or without oxygen. Now, that means at the start of any sort of activity, while our, our acute responses are low, we're not breathing heavily, our heart rate's low, we don't have very high oxygen supply, we can still break down carbohydrates to get energy. That is our anaerobic glycolysis that we talk about, using glycogen as a fuel source from our carbohydrates, our food fuel. We can break them down really quickly and again get energy at a really high rate. We spoke about the byproducts, metabolic byproducts, lactic acid being a problem. Man, if we rely on, on breaking down that glycogen without oxygen, we're going to fatigue quickly. So our preference is to break down glycogen with oxygen present. So we can break down this food fuel with or without oxygen. If we break it down anaerobically, it's really helpful for high intensity activity. So something like a 400 meter sprint where it might take a minute is going to really heavily rely on that anaerobic glycolysis. Glycogen is the fuel source. It is also good for endurance. When we break glycogen down with oxygen, we get non-fatigue byproducts and we can go for a long period of time. That is good. One of the downsides is we have limited stores. So we're only going to have about two hours of physical activity that we'll be able to do relying on our glycogen stores before we deplete those stores. Now, what would happen is we're going to eat, um, we might eat things like energy gels, energy bars, drink sports drinks, um, eat bananas, as we're exercising, so we're going to hopefully keep those glycogen stores topped up. Likely we're going to be burning through them, breaking them down quicker than we're putting them back in, so we may run out. Our third uh, fuel source, our food fuel that we'll talk about, are fats. 
Now, fats are good from the point of view that we have almost an endless supply of fat stores in our body. A, a reasonably lean 80 kilogram individual will be able to survive for about two weeks on their stored fat. Right, so we have huge amounts of fat stores. So the good thing about using fats as a fuel is that we won't run out. We can keep burning them for a long, long, long time. The only time we're going to run out, and I'll, I'll go to this now, is if we do get lost in the desert, lost in the bush, something like that, for a long period of time, multiple weeks without being able to eat anything. That is the only time we'll completely run out of glycogen, fat. Then we may need to rely on protein as a fuel source. It's not really applicable to sporting situations. It's only a survival mechanism. So I'm not going to go into that anymore. Protein for our sport is more important for rebuilding muscle damage. Um, so repairing muscle damage and, and building muscle tissue. That's what our primary focus of protein is. If we are in a survival situation, we may need to use protein as a fuel source. Um, all right, over to fat. So we said they're good because we have huge fat stores. They're going to last us for, for as long as we need, really. They're gonna, we're going to have enough. The downside is that they require large amounts of oxygen. It requires a lot of oxygen molecules to break down a fat molecule. It also takes a long time. So we can't get energy quickly. We're not going to be able to do high intensity activity using fat as a fuel source because it takes so long to break it down and we're not going to be able to resynthesize that ATP at a very fast rate. Um, so with that being said, fat is going to be our primary fuel source at rest. So if we're sitting around doing nothing, we will be able to break down fats. Right now, I'm not gasping for breath. I have plenty of available oxygen. I don't need high energy levels, so I can use my fat stores. I'm gonna prioritize my fat stores at times like this because I won't run out. I don't wanna be burning through carbohydrate stores because I might wanna use them later for more high intense activity. As we start to exercise, low intensity exercise, where we still have lots of available oxygen, we can still rely on these fat stores to provide a lot of energy. Trying to save these carbohydrates, you might have heard the term glycogen sparing. The longer that I can use fats, it means I can save my glycogen stores for later. If I want to do a sprint finish at the end of an event, I'm going to need some carbohydrates, some glycogen stores to allow me to perform at a high intensity because the fats will not allow that. As exercise intensity increases, we're going to start to drift away from relying on our fat stores and we're going to start relying more on our carbohydrate stores. As we need greater oxygen supply around the body, we're not going to have as much spare oxygen to worry about breaking down fat stores. So when we get to about 70% of our aerobic power, 70% of our VO2 max as an intensity, we're going to see what we call the crossover period, where we're going to go from fat providing a greater percentage of our energy to carbohydrates, to now carbohydrates providing a greater energy. So just prior, about 70%, probably 50-50, half of our ATP resynthesis coming from breaking down fats, aerobic lipolysis, and half coming from breaking down carbohydrates or glycogen, aerobic glycolysis. As we go beyond that, we're going to start preferentially breaking down carbohydrates. We're starting to not have as much available oxygen, so we're going to put that into this, which requires much less oxygen to break down glycogen. We can do it much quicker, rather than how much longer and more oxygen it takes over here, so that we can perform at a higher intensity. All right, so in a summary, chemical fuels, food fuels. Our chemical fuels, our ATP and our PC. We can break, we can, we can break these down really quick, resynthesize with PC really quick, so good for explosive efforts, but we are gonna deplete those fuel stores really quickly. Glycogen, glycogen is more suited to high intensity activities. Once we've depleted those PC stores through our anaerobic glycolysis, will allow us to perform at a high level. We can break that down really quickly. And some, some higher intensity endurance activity. So running a marathon, an, an elite marathon runner will still be running at a high intensity for about two hours. They're gonna be relying mainly on their carbohydrate stores because they need that energy at a high rate. Our fat stores, they're gonna be more used at rest and very low intensity. In a sporting situation, maybe something like an Ironman, which is gonna last for 10 hours. Right, we said we're gonna run out of glycogen stores in about two hours, so if we need to go for 10 hours, we're gonna to have to burn some fat stores as well as our glycogen stores. An ultra marathon that might be 12 hours, 20 hours, we're gonna to have to rely on our fat stores, hence we see the reduced intensity. Uh, that's all for today. Uh, any questions that you've had from the last two uh, Instagram TV posts that we've done, make sure you send us a message with those. Um, put up a few exam questions tomorrow based on fuels, and then Friday we're gonna to get to all the questions that we've had sent through. Thanks for watching.